So it's an honor to have you here this morning. We're working our way through the Bible uh, at about 20,000 feet. We're just going to dip down to about 8,000 feet for a little bit today. We'll zoom back up and make a little more progress next week. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, I had an interesting opportunity about uh, two weeks ago. I was on an airplane seated next to Willie Robertson. Uh, if you watch Duck Dynasty, uh, you might know Willie. And I was intrigued to find out he had been a youth minister before he got into the family biz. And as a youth minister, I was just having a lot of trouble picturing it. I just, you know, maybe it was the Church of the Hell's Angels or something, but whoa, I just didn't see it. And then I came across a picture of him when he was in high school, and I thought, well, the kid can clean up. But I was asking him about what transitioned his life from youth ministry into the Duck Dynasty world. His mullet, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the gimme. Um, I asked him about it, and, and he said to me, he says, you know, I found that, that what I needed to do was serve God, but I can serve God in a lot of different arenas. And he said, truth be told, what's happened in the Duck Dynasty world has opened up the horizons and vistas and audiences for me far beyond what it would have been if I'd just stayed uh, the youth minister that I was. And I said, okay, so what was involved in making that decision? And I was asking him in part because I had these lessons coming up. And I know that, that I wanted to really focus our attention in the book of Acts on the decision-making process of what choices do we make? How do we choose to spend our time? What are we choosing to do with our days? What are we choosing to do with our lives? How do we make determinations of where we go from one place to another? And I was intrigued of what he said. And he says, you know, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of people that want God to write something on the wall for them. And he says, I just don't see that happening very often. He said, I think what happens is God gives you principles, he gives you directions, he gives you a, 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 a clear scriptural understanding of priorities, and he expects you to make decisions, trusting that when you make them in accordance with what direction he does give you, that he'll bless you in it. And I said, ah, so you're talking not as a youth minister maybe, but you're talking about Proverbs 3. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't rely on your own insight, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Think about him. What would he have you do? He will make your path straight. God offers the assurance that as long as we're living with a recognition of who he is, trying to, to, to acknowledge him in what we're doing, he will make our path straight. He said, yes, that's it. <clears throat> Interesting conversation. Now, I want to fast forward, and I want to take you to uh, Chicago, where I was uh, for a few days this week, or last week, I guess. In Chicago, I had a chance to visit with a federal judge. He's a godly man, uh, teaches Sunday school. Um, his daddy was a Baptist preacher. And I was asking him, he said, what are you teaching in class? And I was telling him. And he says, uh, he says, so what do you think about how people make choices and why they make the choices they do? And I said, it all depends. I told him about the conversation with Willie Robertson that I might, uh, I might start the class out with that. And he gave me another example to start the class with. I said, what's that? He said, well, my daddy was a preacher, as you know. And I said, yes. He said, I can remember as a kid, people would come up to my dad all the time. And whenever they had something they wanted to do, whether it made sense or not, they'd say to my dad, you know, deep inside, I just have a feeling that this is what God wants me to do. And he said, my dad would look at him and say, son, that's not God you're feeling. That's just a bad jalapeno. <laughs> and I said, you know, you know, it's an interesting idea on how do we make this determination of 
what God wants us to do. And I'd love to give you some hard and fast one, two, three, four, five rule. But God hasn't given us a hard and fast one, two, three, four, five rule. So instead, what I'm going to do is say, let's just sort of look at the book of Acts with that in our mind as we're reading it. Recognizing that we're not going to develop a theology or a list of, of how it's going to be done because Acts is just the story of the history of the church growing. So we're going to see the growth of the church. And while we don't want to take an example here or an example there and build theology out of it, you don't take an anecdote and make it a general rule. We at least will be able to look at these stories and these anecdotes and they will give us information that helps us figure out how God might be moving and how we might make choices. So with that, let's look at it. How do we make our choices? What are we going to do in this regard? Acts itself as a book, we've divided up in the handouts that I'm giving you into five different sections. So I want us to stay in flow. I don't want to simply pull out something in Acts. I want us to stay in flow of the whole book. So Acts begins with Jesus' ascension after his resurrection. And that first section of Acts is the birth of the church. It's Peter uh, uh, on Pentecost and the other apostles having the Holy Spirit come upon them. And they preach, Peter preaches that first Pentecostal sermon. 3,000 people are added to the church. There are people from all over the Roman Empire in Jerusalem for that holiday that take the word back and even if they weren't converted at least they've got an idea a seed has been planted and so we went through that already then last week we also looked at the second section which is a section of persecution a section of the church's expansion this is where Paul and others were persecuting the church in fact the, the Jewish authorities were so desperate to stamp out Christianity that they brought really hard persecution on the church. Persecution that normally would make anybody less convicted say, okay, I was just joking. You know, I wasn't, wasn't that serious about this stuff. You know, if you're going to kill me over it. You know. But here's the church in its infancy. It's just been a year or so since Jesus was ascended to heaven. They had very real experiences with them. And the, the church's real experiences with the risen Savior that they know had been crucified, they know had been dead, they know physically from touching, from eating, from, from being with Him that He had resurrected. So it did not matter to them the level of persecution. They were not going to turn away from what was 100% confident, experientially confirmed in their lives. And they stood up to it. So Stephen is gladly stoned and killed and martyred for his faith. While Stephen's doing it, one of the principal people holding the cloaks for the stoning is a man called Saul... That's his Jewish name. His Roman name is Paul. We know him as St. Paul. This is just before he became St. Paul. And so Paul is there and Paul takes it upon himself to persecute the church. And he's trying so hard to stamp it out that all it really does is cause the church to disperse. It's like if the church had been a stain on Judaism's garment. Instead of cutting out the stain, all they did is dilute it by spreading it. And now all throughout that area, the Christians have gone to flee the persecution, but they've taken the faith with them. And that brings us to the section that we're going to look at today, the third section of Acts. Here we've got Luke, who wrote Acts, same man that wrote the Gospel of Luke. 
Here we've got Luke describing and telling us about the actions of Peter and how the Gentiles first entered into the church. Next week we'll come back and deal with Paul's first missionary journey, the apostolic decree. Then uh, probably the week after that, Paul's unexpected route to Rome. But that's what we've got. Today we're going to look at the actions of Peter and the entrance of the Gentiles, which is found in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 32, going through chapter 12, verse 24. Now I think what may help us is to keep a map in our brain so that we know how this church is expanding. We can look at the map and put Jerusalem up on it. Uh, thank Google Earth for this uh, view of the Mediterranean world. Um, we can see Jerusalem. Now, we're going to get some stories that happen here, but before we get to exactly where the stories happened, let's add a cross because Jerusalem has become a, the center of the church. But by the time we're in this point in the book of Acts, we know the church is also in Damascus. And that's the second cross I've put on the map. We know that because that's where Paul was not only converted, but and the scales fell from his eyes. He was on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus, and it was in Damascus that Paul stayed and taught. So we've got the church in Damascus. Then Paul, by the time we reach this point in Acts, has gone home to Tarsus. So I'll put a third cross up in Tarsus because we know that Paul is there. And so we've got Paul in Tarsus, his hometown. We've got the church spread beyond that, but for these purposes, we're going to leave it right there for right now. Uh, we've got the church in Judea. Actually, I threw another cross up, sorry. That's in Judea and Galilee because we know the church has spread into that environment as well. Now, today our story starts in Lydda. Lydda is a town around uh, 11 miles or so outside, uh, uh, kind of west of Jerusalem, and in Lydda, Peter goes, and he's doing some itinerant mission work, and while he's in Lydda, there's a man who's been lame for eight years, and Peter heals the man. The healing takes place, and then people in Joppa nearby hear about it. So the people in Joppa have a very dear woman of the church. Her name is Tabitha. Tabitha in Aramaic means gazelle. In Greek, gazelle is Dorcas. So if your name is Dorcas, you're a gazelle. Your name is also Tabitha. You can take names and chart them across language by what they mean. If your name is Nathaniel in Hebrew, Nathaniel, Natan El, means gift of God. You want to say gift of God in Greek? Theodore. Theos Dores. Theodore. So Nathaniel in Hebrew becomes Theodore in the Greek. Tabitha in Hebrew becomes Dorcas in the Greek. Bless you. Now, Dorcas or Tabitha has gotten ill. She dies. The church sends for Peter, who's nearby in Joppa, I mean in Lydda. Peter goes to Joppa, and he sends everybody out. And he Now, why does he go to Joppa? Because he was asked to. He doesn't know that he's going to raise this woman, God's going to use him to raise this woman from the dead. He may just be going to do her funeral. He may just be going to love on the church. But it was the right thing, it seemed to him, to go, so he goes. While he's there, he goes in and he prays, and God uses him to raise Tabitha, Dorcas, from the dead. It's an amazing moment. It is no wonder with these types of miracles and with this eyewitness testimony that the church is spreading like fire. And so while Peter is there, Peter stays for a while. Luke tells us that Peter stays at the house of Simon 
the tanner. Now, we're living in the 21st century. Why do we care what Simon did? What's the point of that little ad? What is a tanner anyway? I mean, my wife Becky, I won't mention the tanning beds. <laughs> she doesn't use tanning beds, I wouldn't let her. The lawyer in me says, no, 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 cancer, cancer, cancer. Um, <laughs> Becky, uh, uh, no, not Becky, Peter. <laughs> is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. You better not be staying at the house of Simon the Tanner, Becky. <laughs> at the house of Simon the Tanner. Now, if he's a tanner, that means he's taking animal skins from dead animals and he's scraping them and working with them and tanning the hides. That, from a Jewish perspective, is unclean work. So Peter is staying at the house of a man who does ceremonially unclean stuff. Pretty significant just in itself. Simon the Tanner also stays by the sea. His house is by the sea. His workshop is by the sea. Because tanning involves chemicals and animals in such a degree that it really stinks and you've got a constant ocean breeze. So he stays by the sea. Those houses, those places were set by the sea for the, the <laughs> um, air purification. So Peter's there at the house of Simon the Tanner. I would suggest to you, the lawyer in me would suggest to you, that Luke tells us it's Simon the Tanner's house at Joppa for another reason also. Luke is into identifying his sources. We saw it in the Gospel of Luke. You'll see it in the book of Acts. Luke is not writing only to record history for Champion Forest Baptist Church in 2013. Luke is writing so that Theophilus can be certain of the things that have had occurred. So Luke is very quick to say, hey, you want to know about the resurrection? Here are the women who saw the empty tomb. Here's their names. Here's how you find them. You want to know about this? Here's the widow of Nain. That's her house. That's where it is. You go find her. You ask her about that story. You want to know about this story? You go to Simon the Tanner. They're in Joppa. Not hard to find. He's by the sea. You can go check this out. See, these are stories written for people to be able to verify. So Peter is there in Joppa and he's staying on for a little while. Now we've got to shift gears and go about 20, no, actually 30 miles north to Caesarea. And yes, Dale, you'll get another email from you today saying you don't like the way I pronounce it. Caesarea. And there in Caesarea, Something wholly different is going on. Caesarea was a Roman port town. You can still see the Roman ruins today if you go there. And as a Roman town, Caesarea has a centurion soldier by the name of Cornelius stationed there. Centurion in the Roman army was a soldier who was over a certain number of troops. Anybody care to guess how many troops? 100. Hence the centurion. He had a century of troops under him. Okay? So you've got a Roman centurion. Now, interestingly enough, this Roman centurion is a devout, God-fearing man. And what that means in Luke's language is that the Roman centurion's not a Jew, but he follows closely Jewish practice. Probably worshipped or attended a synagogue. There was a point in history that happened, uh, started about two or three hundred years before Christ, 
but where some of the more intellectual elite within Greek and Roman citizenry started recognizing that this idea of there being all of these different gods really doesn't make sense. That there must be one central force. There must be one, if there's a supreme being, it's a supreme being. They didn't know if he, the supreme being, was a he or an it. So you had some Greek philosophers that considered him an it, just a power. But these people were attracted to the Jewish religion because it was the only religion out there that was teaching this idea that there was one God and had been doing this for over a thousand years. So it was an antique, ancient religion that predated anything they had. So you had these people that were called God-fearers. They feared God, but they did not convert to Judaism. For the men, supposedly, the biggest obstacle was circumcision. The idea of a 30-year-old man voluntarily undergoing that seems to have been a bit of a hindrance to growing the Jewish population by proselytism, conversion. So you've got this centurion who is giving alms to the poor, who's being careful and, and following a good bit of the Jewish practice. And in fact, like a good Jew, he's doing his daily prayers. So on day one, as Luke recounts this story, at 3 p.m., the centurion is praying. And while he's praying, he has a vision. He is told, the centurion Cornelius is told, to send men down to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. To ask for a man named Peter and to bring Peter back so that Peter can talk to the centurion. So the centurion does. Now he's a devout man who feared God with all his household. So it's not just him, but it's the people who are in his household. That means his family, but it's more than his family, it means his servants. So he's a devout man who fears God with all of his household. He gives his alms generously to the people. He prays continually to God. And he takes and he responds to the direction he got by taking three men, a Roman soldier and two servants. And he sends the three men out. He says, go down to Joppa. Go to the house of Simon the Tanner. It's by the sea. Ask for a man named Peter. Tell him to come back. Why does he send one soldier? Probably to protect the entire, I mean, that's the escort, the armed guard. Why does he send two servants? I suspect if I were him, I'd be saying, wonder what Peter's going to think if I send three Roman soldiers and say, come. Versus two servants and a bodyguard. So a bodyguard and two servants. By the way, I've tried to pick pictures that truly reflect the dress of a centurion, of a normal Roman soldier, and of Roman servants. Real story, and we got to get ourselves in the brain of what happened then. So day two, these guys go. Now day two, at the noon hour, Peter is up on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house praying. And he's hungry. It's lunchtime. They're making dinner, lunch for him downstairs. He's waiting for the lunch upstairs, praying, and he has a vision. And in the vision, a sheet-like, tablecloth-like thing drops down from heaven and it looks like the four corners are being held up. And it comes down because in the middle of it are all sorts of four-legged creatures. All sorts of birds 
and all sorts of reptiles. And there's a voice that says, take, kill, and eat. Whoa, don't go there yet. Take, kill, and eat. Peter's response is, hey, I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. Now remember, Jewish law, Jewish dietary kosher law, says you don't eat pigs, pork, you don't eat reptiles, you don't eat uh, 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 a lot. You don't eat certain kinds of birds. So this sheet coming down has got clean and unclean meat. Not only do you not eat certain kinds, but you have to butcher them in a special way to make them kosher. So the whole idea of, hey, kill it, need it, is like a double no-no. By the way, when I was doing the uh, visiting with the Duck Dynasty people, Phil Robertson, the patriarch, got up and, and was talking to a group of people and he said, I don't know how many of you out there are vegetarians. He says, I'm not. And I'm not because of this passage of scripture. God said, take, kill, and eat. And he said, creatures with four legs. How many legs got a deer? Four. Rack them and stack them. <laughs> Of course, he says the same thing for a squirrel. <laughs> says it for anything. Four legs, boom, done. Bird, done. Reptile, done. Rack them and stack them. So anyway, this, the things this story has brought forth in our world. Um, so Peter's there. Peter's told, take, kill, and eat. Peter says, oh, I'm not going to do anything unclean. Never done it before. Not going to start now. And this word comes. What God has made clean, you don't call it common, ordinary, unclean, unkosher. Same vision happens the second time. Peter, bless his heart, says the same thing. Here's the voice from heaven a second time. What God has made clean, don't call common. Third time. Sheet comes down, take, kill, and eat. Peter, oh no. What God has made clean, don't call common. Peter gets the message. And about this same time, knock, knock, knock on the gate. Here are these three men, soldier and two uh, servants. We're here for Peter. Peter. You got a bunch of Gentiles down here who want to see you. One's a soldier. He has a sword. Peter comes down. What's up? We've been sent by Cornelius. Peter is told by an angel to go with these guys. So Peter says, hey, I go. Doesn't go that day. At that point, it's late in the day. So it's day three when they go back. Let's clean this picture up a little bit. Um, okay, day three. Day three, they go back. Now, if you've been in this class for a long time, you'll remember back when we covered Daniel in the Old Testament, I gave you a handout on the importance of numbers back in, in ancient times, how even in the New Testament times, numbers had special significance. And so the number three has always been seen as not just within Judaism, but all of the cultures back in that day considered three a very divine number. I don't know if you're catching how many times there are threes here, but Cornelius sends out three messengers. The sheet drops three times for Peter. It's on the third day that Peter goes out there. The threes are constantly being repeated by Luke here to show us and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's not our way of communicating, but it's his way of communicating in that era. It's just a subtle way of saying, God's behind this. God's behind this. God's behind this. So if we miss his message, if we don't just pause long enough to see that. So day three, Peter goes, and he goes to Cornelius. And when Peter goes to Cornelius, Cornelius has all of his household around him. 
Peter comes in and Cornelius falls before Peter in worship. This is a Roman centurion. Peter says, stand up, I'm a man just like you are. So the soldier stands up. <clears throat> Peter says, listen, I'm Jewish. You obviously know something about us. You go to synagogue, maybe, but we always keep you on the other side of the cord because we don't associate, we don't, you know, we are Jewish, we're exclusive, even though Peter's a Christian. And Cornelius says, Peter says, what do you want from me? Why did you, why'd you call me up here? Peter doesn't know, is he in trouble? He doesn't have a clue. And Cornelius says, well, I was praying on day one at three o'clock. And while I was praying, I was told to send for you. That you would be at the house of Simon the tanner in Joppa by the sea. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, God's so neat. Peter says, this, you know, he pokes his head. This is the point of the sheet coming down. How dare I stand here and say, I'm a Jew and you're a common man. God made you just like he made me. Now it makes sense. I know why you were supposed to sin for me. I've got to tell you about Jesus. And Peter tells him about Jesus. And while Peter's telling him about Jesus, obviously the centurion starts believing in Jesus. I mean, how, how would he not? And not only the centurion, but all of his household and the Holy Spirit falls on them in, a, in an obvious way as they start, they, they start manifesting things beyond their skills and their abilities. And it's so obvious to everybody, Peter, who took some of the brothers with him, he did not go alone. We find out later he had six with him. So there was a complement of seven, one for each day of the week, a complete and total number. Peter takes seven with him, or six with him. Peter made seven. And Peter looks at him and says, hey, it's very clear the Holy Spirit's visited them just like us. They're Gentiles, but I mean, they're like in. They're believers. There's no, can you think of any reason? What could keep us from baptizing them into the church? Uh, I got nothing. Okay, so they do. And you have the, this massive Gentile ceremony of baptism. And the Roman soldier, the centurion, and his household, they're all added to the church and saved. Peter goes skipping back to Jerusalem to report the good news. Let's get our map back up there. Uh, before we do, Peter says, Truly I understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And with that, Peter leaves Caesarea and he goes back to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he tells the church, y'all aren't going to believe what's just happened. And nothing personal, because all of y'all are in a church right now. But people are people. Even saved people have ways to go on the old redemption thing. You follow me 24-7, you'll find areas where you say, boy, he needs to clean up his act. It's true for all of us. And sure enough, Peter goes back, and wouldn't you know, there are some people in the church saying, well, you did the wrong thing. Peter, <laughs> mistake. These people, if they want to be in the church, that's fine, but they need to become Jewish first. This is a Jewish church. Let them convert to Judaism, then they can become Christians. Peter says, I'm not sure I told you the whole story. Let me tell you about this vision I had. And he lays it all out. Then even the cynics said, oh, I take it back. Psych. Okay, it's all right. You did good, Peter. Now we're cooking with peanut oil. It's great stuff. So that's what happens. And you have this Gentile infusion in the church. Now Luke goes another step and he reminds us again, we're in Luke, uh, Acts 11 at this point, that there was such persecution that the church had dispersed. And some of the church had gone up to a place called Antioch. Let's see if I'm losing my remote control. Antioch, there. 
Antioch's that cross, I've just added up there. You've got them on the island of Crete, that's the island, and you've got the church in Antioch. There are believers in both of those places. And from the island of Crete, some of those people were going over to Antioch. Now Antioch, understand Antioch uh, um, is, here's a picture of some of the ruins today. At the time, third largest city in the Roman Empire. Largest is Rome, second is Alexandria, Egypt, third largest is Antioch in Syria, modern day Syria. And so they go over to Antioch, uh, these men from Crete, and they take the gospel message. There's already a church in Antioch, but these men are going and preaching to the Gentiles. Not simply to Gentiles who are showing up at synagogue and God-fearers. They're going to people that may not have any familiarity with Judaism at all. Here's the way Luke puts it. Can we go to the Elmo? Yes. Are we on the Elmo? Yeah, we're on the Elmo. So, Luke says it this way. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which is actually west of Egypt, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. These are Greek-speaking non-Jews in this reference. So, when they spoke with them, they were preaching the Lord Jesus. Do you see that? The Lord Jesus? That's, that's a little um, buzzword that we don't get in the English today, if we're not careful. When, when the apostles and the church preached to the Jewish believers, they would preach Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Messiah, Christ being the Greek word for the Hebrew Messiah, anointed. In other words, this is the anointed one of Israel. But if you're talking to a Greek speaker who has no familiarity with the Jewish faith at all, what good does it do you to preach to him and say, hey, this is the anointed one of Israel? Israel who? Israel. So? I'm not an Israelite. Why do I care about the anointed one of Israel? So it does no good to preach Jesus Christ, Jesus as Messiah. These men were preaching Jesus as Lord, the Greek word kurios. The Greeks had the understanding of a Lord, a kurios, a, a Savior, who might help them as divine. And so, so, so these men are preaching Jesus to those people as the divine God in a Greek sense, not simply as a Hebrew savior of the Jewish people. So the word gets down to Jerusalem of what's going on in Antioch. And the church decides to send Barnabas up to Antioch to check on things and to help. Barnabas is a natural choice. He's got that gift of encouragement. And so Barnabas goes up to the church and he starts helping and he's preaching and it's working and, and the, the church is growing and it's thriving. And he's been up there for a while and he realizes, I need some help. I need somebody who's able to not only understand the Jewish part of our faith, but who's also able to speak to the Greeks and understands Greek life and Greek culture. Who could I get? Huh. You know, it's been a long time since I've seen Paul. But Paul, for years now, has been up in Tarsus. He just went home. I hope Paul stayed faithful. I trust he has. But I need to go see with my own eyes if Paul is the answer to this problem. And so, Tarsus, it's the cross that's up a little bit upper left from Antioch, or if we were talking, it would be northwest of Antioch, around on the coast of Turkey. Not actually a coastal town, it's a little bit inland. But Paul is still there. 
And Barnabas goes himself, finds Paul. Sure enough, Paul's in. Paul and Barnabas return. And for a year, they stay there in Antioch, building the church and preaching and teaching, and it's wonderful. Word comes out that there's going to be a famine. So the church at Antioch, Jews and Greeks, put together a collection of food for the church down in Judea, Jerusalem and send it with Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas go down from Antioch and, uh, into Jerusalem. While Paul and Barnabas are there, the king at the time is Herod Agrippa. Now, if you read the Bible, you're going to read lots of Herods. It was a pretty common name. You're going to read lots of kings and princes and rulers and other things. And you'll have Herod the Tetrarch, and you'll have Herod the King, you'll have Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II. It's really tough to figure out since we don't live there. I mean, it's, you get a smidgen of it if I talk about President Bush. You might say, well, which one? Okay, same way with King Herod. So I put in your handout a uh, family tree with some references to the different people in Scripture, so you can kind of follow them. But we're talking about King Herod Agrippa I. By the way, you can date this, 44 AD. So we're probably about 14 years from the ascension of Jesus. Church is about 14 years old. Herod Agrippa comes into power, and he starts, per or, well, he's already in power, but Herod Agrippa decides to persecute the church. He gets James, the Apostle James, James and John, sons of Zebedee. He gets James, the Apostle John's brother, and he puts him to death with the sword. It pleases the Jews. So he decides he's going to do more. So he has Peter arrested. Peter gets arrested, and, and Herod locks him up, doesn't just lock him up, shackles him to soldiers on each side, puts soldiers at the gates, makes a big show out of it. Says it's Passover time, but as soon as the holiday's over, I'm going to execute Peter in front of everybody. We'll really put this church down. The Jews will love me. And so Peter's there locked up in the prison. And there's this marvelous passage. Um... There's a marvelous passage. Let's see. I think it's, uh, I got to find it, but it's a marvelous passage. It's 12, 5. It's Acts 12, verse 5. Yeah, that's up there. And I say find it because I, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, if you think about it, Peter, James has just been executed. Peter's arrested. There's a big show. And, and the way Luke writes this passage, you, you, just, you just need to read it in the Greek. I'm sorry. You're saying, I don't read Greek. It doesn't matter. You need to read it in the Greek anyway, okay? Because it's just phenomenal Greek writing. And you, you miss it in the English. There's just, it's just not there. It's just not there. So um, this is one of the key Greek words you need to know. And then here's the other Greek words you need to know. The first Greek word I underlined is the Greek word men, M-E-N. I'll put it into English letters for you. M-E-N dot, dot, dot. And you have a phrase. And then you have the Greek word day, D-E, dot, 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 because you have another phrase, men, day, men, day. You learn in first year Greek, when you have men with a phrase and day, you're setting up two things, on the one hand, on the other hand, or in boxing terminology. In this corner we have, and in this corner. And that's the way 
Luke's writing this. He's setting it up. This is about, this is on one hand and on the other. So on one hand, you've got Herod who locks Peter up and keeps Peter between the soldiers and has destiny of death written for Peter. But on the other hand, in this corner, the church is earnestly praying for Peter. Are you ready for the, let's get ready to rumble. All right. I mean, that's what's getting set up here in the Greek. It's fantastic. And so the story unfolds. And as the story unfolds, Herod Agrippa, an angel comes in the night and releases Peter from the shackles. Idiot soldiers sleeping. Angel says, get up takes him out to the gate. The gate opens by itself. Do you know how to say that in Greek? Automate. It opens automatically. <laughs> That's where we get the word from, by itself. Automatic comes from the Greek, automate. Okay? So the gate just opens automatically. And Peter goes right through. He's going through the dark alleys and streets. There's a death warrant out for him. He's supposed to, the next morning is when Herod's bringing him out to kill him. So that very night before he's dead, he goes and he goes to Mary's house and he bangs on the gate. Rhoda, who is it? It's Peter. Well, Rhoda's in there, Mary's in there, the whole church is in there praying earnestly for Peter. Rhoda, what? It's Peter. Bless her heart. She leaves the gate locked and turns around, runs in and tells everybody, Peter's outside, Peter's outside. This is the greatest thing. Peter's looking around. I hope I don't get arrested until someone comes back. That is why I make Rhoda the patron saint of all airheads. <laughs> so everybody comes back and says, oh, that's not him. That's someone faking his voice. Well, who is it? It's Peter. Please let me in. And so they open up, he goes in, everybody's just a buzz over what happened, he lays it all out, then he says, I gotta go, I'm going into hiding. And he goes into hiding. Luke doesn't tell us where, Luke probably didn't know where. To this day, we don't. He goes into hiding. The next morning, Herod comes out. Oh, by the way, ah, we're running out of time. Okay, so I meant to tell you this, I just left it alone. There's a church tradition that's written down historically about 200 years after this event is the first we have it in writing for us today. That the guard for Herod who took James to be beheaded, to be executed, was so moved by his testimony, he became a Christian and was beheaded with James. It's amazing to me how even in death, God can move. And if we think of death as the end of the road, then it makes no sense to us why God would be that way and God seems harsh and, he, and he's something that, that, that doesn't seem fair. But if we recognize that death is just the door into eternity, it, he's not so harsh. All right, so anyway, we have the boxing match and who wins? God. There was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. The next day, it's like, bring Peter out. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, he, he was... Uh, uh. So Herod beheads the soldiers, kills them. Then Herod goes off, and uh, when Herod goes off... Ah, boy, we got to get through this. Okay, this is really good. So Herod goes to Caesarea. Herod goes off and he's doing his Roman thing. And there are a bunch of people north in Tyre and Sidon who are upset with him, Luke says. And Luke says, as a result, um, uh, he goes in front of them and he gives this oration and he comes out dressed all duded up. Or as Luke says, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to the people. And, and the people were shouting, the voice of a God, not of a man. Oh, it's great to be seen as the much, much greater role of a God than a man. Now, this story is in contrast to Peter, the godly man, who just two chapters earlier, when the Roman centurion in, in Caesarea is falling down before him, Peter says, you stand up, I'm a man just like you. Not so wicked King Herod Agrippa. He delivers his oration, and then... People acclaim him in his royal robes. And immediately he's struck with an intestinal disease and he dies shortly thereafter. 
Josephus, the Jewish historian, records the same story, just not from the Christian enlightenment, but it reads very much the same, and I've put that in your lesson. I don't have time to read it for you now, but it's worth reading how it's preserved in history, just like it is in the book of Acts. At any rate, Luke draws this to a close with the following point. And it's this whole in this corner, in this corner idea. If we don't catch the juxtaposition of these stories, we're missing something Luke's saying. While Herod Agrippa delivers this incredible oration in his royal robes and his acclaim to God, he dies in his arrogance for who he is as an unrighteous and wicked king. Meanwhile, oh, and what did his oration say? Oh, uh -huh. his words died with him. They're lost in the pages of history. But if you note in contrast to his oration, Luke ends this by saying, the word of God increased and multiplied. And that's how he brings it to a close. Yeah, the oration of the wannabe God erased in history. But the word of God continued to multiply and grow because nothing was going to stop the hand of God. Couldn't happen. So, what is it? Jalapeno? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, rely not on your own insight and all your ways acknowledge Him. I got to tell you, God can move and teach and direct in all sorts of ways. Our job's just to be holy and trying to figure out what He wants us to do and doing it. And acknowledge Him and love Him for it. And that's where we are. Points for home. First, stand up. I too am a man. Peter had that right. Herod had that wrong. I remember my preacher growing up when I was about to get out of law school. I was graduating from law school. He said, I have some graduation advice for you. I said, what's that? It's Ken Dye. He comes to our class some when he's in town. He said, uh, don't get above your raisin. I said, I don't, I don't understand what that is. Don't get above your raisin. He says, don't start thinking of yourself as something high and mighty. You walk your life in humility as a child of God. You seek to love and you seek to serve everybody you can. Because if you start elevating yourself, God will bring you down. It's good advice. And it's a good reminder for all of us. Next. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? There's this Greek word kaluo that's used by Luke repeatedly through these passages. It means a hindrance. He's used it with the Ethiopian eunuch who said, there's water. What kaluo, what hinders me from being baptized? It's used to, you know, should I get in the way of God? What's to hinder Cornelius from being baptized? Who was I that I could stand in God's way? People tried to stand in God's way. Herod tried to. It just never worked. God's will will be done. It's just a question of whether we're on the train or not. And you can get on the train or the train can run you over. But don't think anybody's going to thwart. If you want a men day with God, you want in this corner you and in that corner God, I promise you, you lose. I'm into that corner God. I want to be on that side. Now, James still got executed. He was still killed. Peter was not. I don't understand how God works, why he works and where it works, but I do know in confidence and in faith that in the end, he is faithful. And that's all I can live by. Last point for home. There was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. You bet there wasn't. We live in the most amazing age. You know, Paul says in Romans, to the Romans, he says, the evidence of God is around us in the world. 
We live in an age where we understand the world so much better than anyone in the history of humanity. We understand why the sun rises and sets, which means the earth is rotating. We understand that children who are a gift of the Lord are also the fruit of sperm and ovum uniting. We understand uh, uh, photosynthesis. We understand so much that our response ought to be, oh, merciful heavens, what a God we worship. He has put together this world. It doesn't run on magic. It runs on the constancy and consistency and the rationality of a God who is constant, consistent, and logical and rational. It runs by the way he set it up to run. We of all people in history ought to be able to admire and appreciate the handiwork of God instead of being the duffel puds who are there saying, well, where'd Peter go? I don't know. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? God was at work. It's a magnificent thing. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for putting us in this earth. I pray that each one of us will find our place before you in humble service for the days you give us. Until you draw us home. In Jesus' name, amen.